Thank you. So this is a talk about the Viata project, which I describe as when you start on a trip and you don't know where you go, where you're going, you end up at a very interesting destination. And uh, sometimes you learn more in the process of getting there than you do at the, do at the start. Um, I'm going to go over the history of uh, Viata and a little bit about it, and kind of what our plan was, what the potholes we discovered and what we learned along the way. It isn't, uh, I'm trying to be a little bit careful. I'm not going to be intentionally talking too much about what we're doing right now in any great detail, but more about stuff that happened back several years ago. Viata was founded in 2005. We got some startup money and started out doing an a software networking application. Initially, the initial version was all done in Zorp, and they did their complete own custom Linux distro. When I joined in 2008, they had made a couple major, first major pivot strategic shift, and that was to switch to Debian, to switch from Zorp, where it was one big monolithic C++ application, to using the standard Quagga routing package. And in the process, we also shifted from being a monolithic thing to using Debian packages. And so that was the big leap forward. We also changed our whole command infrastructure to make it templates and extensible. And then we fast forward in history. There's a big jump in here, which I'll be talking about. And then in 2012, Brocade acquired Viata, and then in 2013, we ended our community version. And in 2014, we released a product version which is on a totally different set of infrastructure, which I'll go a little bit about, but that's not what this is about. Um, one of the things you quickly discover when you start a new project is you make up a plan. That plan is a really good idea. It's what you best understand at the moment. But plans go by the wayside pretty quick. The plan was basically, there's this great, wonderful free software. The free software was able to, you could create a software router before Viata even started. But it wasn't a package that was amenable to networking providers. It didn't have a uniform interface, and there was nobody you could provide, get the software from. So we said, free software, we'll use open source to get free publicity, and we'll get free developers, and we'll do great. So we, the initial intention was, Viata was going to be the Red Hat of software networking. And we were going to attack that mature, proprietary, Cisco market. And if you look at technologies, what you see is this kind of curve. There's a little start over here where the people that adopt the new technology, the innovators that really go for every new thing. And over here, you have the enterprise and the really conservative customers. So being a new technology, we were focusing on the early adopters, the innovators out here. And we were, I knew that we would eventually get up the curve to deal with the big, really take on the big customers. And when you're doing that, when you're trying to get over here and get these people, open source is really important. And why is it important? It gets you attention. It gets you noticed. Because you want to get those innovators, you've got to be noticed. So you will find every open source project gets way more attention than they are really deserved from any revenue or any, any actionable things. So th the choice of open source and free software was 90% dedicated to this. Get the attention, get people going. And what we were doing was the way the routing 
world works today from all the legacy vendors is they have a big monolithic command line proprietary protocols. Then they use Linux as some sort of underlying op or BSD as some underlying operating system to basically boot their application. And then they have hardware. And what we were doing was have an open source command line, all extensible, use open source routing protocols, use Linux, and use Linux as the underlying software data plane. So our model was completely different. So that's why we had to attract people. And the way that was broken down is there's three main parts of a router. You have the actual forwarding engine and hardware or software. You have the control plane, in which case that was our extended command line. And then you have all the routing protocols. So we had all three, all three were open source. So what we wanted was free users, free developers. We actually succeeded in that. We had, world, we, we had a map. We had a map of where every user was. The way that worked is you went to our website, you download the ISO. The default configuration on the ISO had an NTP server pointed to Viata, Pool, NT. And so we got the IP of every user that booted the ISO up. We mapped that out. We had users in New Zealand, Iceland, China, all over the world. In the end, when we finally closed down the open source version, we had over a million downloads. We had a bugzilla where you could go enter things. We had a very active IRC chat line. And you could actually go point at our Git repositories, download the package source, download the rules to build the ISO, and build your own ISO. So we'd gone the whole nine yards. So we had pretty much set that up. And we got some amazing things. The best documentation we got was this book written in Japanese by the Japanese, what, Kintaro of the Japanese user group. Now, that isn't to say we didn't write documentation. We had a documentation team that at one point somebody printed out the whole PDF of dead trees, and it was a whole bookshelf of documentation. So it was way almost over documented, but this was the best user example walkthrough was created from the community. But we had this dream that we would get a platform and we would get developers. We had the dream of if you build it, they will come. Well, we got users, but in reality, we didn't get developers. And I, I felt bad about this. And I, when I was playing this talk, I said, go look at some statistics. If you look at Ubuntu, which probably the most successful community distribution out there, and see the ratio of people downloading to people contribute that are actually listed as developers to the amount of contributions, you're lucky to get a tenth of 1% of your users actually contribute anything back. It's not a huge surprise, but it really didn't work very well. And part of that I blame on, if you saw this morning's talk, John O'Bacon, we didn't have any community manager. We didn't have any foundation or any infrastructure behind it. And we intentionally or unintentionally had no contributor agreement in place. And the, the, honestly, the way to get things back to us was people would interact with us in mail and IRC and send us patches. So we didn't have any kind of formalized pull request. So it's kind of a chicken and egg. We didn't have these things in place that we could scale up with contributors. But it's not clear to me that if we had these, we would have gotten that many more contributors either. So what do you do when your plans don't work out. Um, there was a bunch of, at the same time, we were being really successful in getting users. And we still are. But those users 
caused us to have problems of scale. So the users were not contributing, but the users were creating lots of stress on the actual infrastructures. And the first one that shows up is routing at scale. If you go connect as a backbone router, this is a graph of how many BGP active prefixes you'll get over the year. So in 2014, you'll get 50,000. Well, it's not uncommon if you're on the internet backbone to get 3 million routes. And we also had people that were wanting to use us in ways, for example, with BGP, you can have an active router and you can have a route reflector so that other people are talking to the route reflector. The software, we solved a lot of the scale issues on routes, but the scale issues on peering were still a problem. And there was a bunch of other scale issues, and they all came down to the routing protocols, the open source ones, were not able to scale up to the level we wanted to reach. And it's kind of not surprising. And if it was an active community like Linux, we would have been able to overcome them. But the, I'll get to it in a bit. The Quagga community was in a kind of awkward state. Um, the other thing is we ran into is the Linux forwarding performance, which is the blue box here, was basically running about a million packets a second per core. And to get to, which was fine for one gig interfaces, but now in data centers, everybody's doing 10 gig, now 25, 40 gig. You really need to be up here at line rate. So about that time, we started to talking to Intel, who had the data plane development kit, which is what these, this graph is on, which lets you in software do that. But in order to use that, we basically had to rewrite a new data plane in software. Also, if you do a re rewrite a new data plane in software, you have to make a fundamental choice of, is that your value add that you're going to create your business on, or is that something you want to open source? Um, given the fact that it was a differentiator at the time, we decided to make it ours. And the routing protocols. We ran into this. It got to a certain point, and it, it had been a problem all along. Got to the point where. First off, the first one that hit is, is there was no, at the time, support for OSPF IPv6. And we actually had promised people a release that summer with OSPF IPv6. And it was due to be on there, and it wasn't getting done by the community in the timely manner. Now, I wasn't the person involved, but I will say that if, if you're dealing with an open source project and you have something you need to have done, you need to be involved in doing it yourself. There was other cases where we needed features in the firewall. We funded the NetFilter team to develop those features. So if there's a feature you want in an open source project, as a customer, as a provider, whatever, you need to be involved. Otherwise, there's no skin in the game. There's nobody who can make you have it. The next one that showed up is BGP. If you have BGP peers, it turns out inside the routing protocols, which have been around for a long time. By the way, Quagga is named after an extinct zebra, which kind of fits right now. Um, this software had been many through many life cycles. And early on, when it had gone from zebra to Quagga, zebra had their own built-in threading library. So they weren't using p-threads. They were using cooperative threading inside the BGP process. This works for simple cases, but it didn't work well when you had 16 million routes and you had 16 peers and you had to change and you had to update this one peer and the other peer is asking you, are you there yet? Are you there yet? And if you're not there for a while, it thinks you're down. It thinks you flapped. So you get in this cycle where you're flapping you're updating your peers. They think you're flapping. And it's all because you're timing out, because you 
didn't do your threading right. Um, there was also a whole lot, Cisco did a great job, or other vendors, of extending BGP to have lots of attributes and selling customers on using those attributes. And Quagga didn't support all that. But the real bottom line is it was a project that had gone through a lot of transitions, kind of like we discovered with OpenSSL with the heartbeat blog, bug. It was something that was core infrastructure, that didn't really have a home, that didn't really have a full-time committed maintainer. At one point, we hired, the Qua we hired the Quagga maintainer for a while. And that still wasn't enough to get the project rolling forward. Now, I say all this, that was at the time, because several other companies have run into this, this project is in much better shape right now. Um, the Open Switch project and Cumulus have both put a lot of effort in to getting it farther along. And several of this project had also suffered from lots of forks out in the wind. And the forks were all over the place. And they're gradually bringing them back in. And one of those, so what did we do about it? Well, it turned out there was a proprietary version, very similar, that had the routing protocols. So it came down to a build versus buy decision in time. So we, for the subscription versions, switched over to proprietary routing protocols. So that was number one. And number two is just the kind of featureitis problem. As we got to higher up the curve of the users, they wanted all these kind of weird features over here. They had been sold, because it's a legacy product, they had been sold all the really, this is cool, whatever feature. And I need to have that. And in order to get into those things, we needed even more features. And some of those weren't in the open source world. And the last thing is, the developers of this basically was up to us. because. Who are our main customers were network operators? How many of them overlap with actual programming? Well, some of them can write scripts. How many of them are actually good at system administration? Well, some. But we only want the, you know, the set of people that could actually contribute as users was quite small. It was a union of all these things. So it was up to us to do it. So, then the final knockout blows came in. So what do you, I mean, the dirty secret. In the VC world, what is support? It's insurance. So you know how the insurance business works? You buy health insurance, they're betting you won't get sick. If, every, if a natural disaster happens, insurance companies go out of business. So if you're writing software, if you're selling support, you're betting that that customer will never call. Well, this was new software. Even if there was no bugs, and sure there were bugs, there was always usability issues. So the real cost of support with new software is quite high. The other problem is we had, both the, we had the freemium model. We had both the subscription and a community version. What happens when you have that? You have to have two releases the free one and the not free one. And if you're doing a good engineering job, that means you have to QA it, two releases. Doesn't get worse. You have to have the Zen version, the Hyper-V version, the VMware version, the bare metal version. So you have to have, you end up with like four, sometimes five different platforms because we were also selling embedded boxes. So you ended up with this geometric explosion of releases. So you sort of get to the point of, I'm not making any money on the free run, but I'm spending a lot of money to put, create it. The other one that we ran into is we would have things like people would buy one copy of the subscription one and then run the free one on all their other servers. Um, so you're, if you're in a new technology, a lot of times what happens is this the stretch between free and the non-free, you're competing with yourself. You really like to be competing with your competitors, but you're competing with yourself. And the, the thing that finally nailed it was 
we ended up with two routing stacks. So we ended up with the proprietary one and the non-proprietary one. And the products started to diverge. And so you could not even, you know, you could pretend before that if there were the same code base on similar hardware, you know, QA once was good. But when it got to be two different routing stacks, it was two different things. So we had succeeded, but we'd failed on the open source side. So what do we do? Like, thinking about backwards afterwards, I discovered business people talk about these S-curves, where you have one technology that goes along and grows, and performance is kind of this nebulous thing. No? And then another, another technology comes along, and it actually has a little bathtub where it starts out and it becomes doesn't look that good. It looks like it's got problems. And then it just explodes. And what happened was we had hit just about this point. We had started to explode. And right now, we see we're somewhere over there. If you see the software networking, it's not just us. It's 18 different vendors are doing software networking. And it's a lot more complicated, a lot more options. Um, and by the way, I also think this will all bathtub out, and there'll be the next thing. There'll be something else after it. And it'll be completely different. And we'll all look like stupid fools for thinking this was cool. Um, so what did we learn in the process? And we still do. The open source tool system and Linux is the most awesome thing out there. There are more things that let you build software faster and easier than anything else. Um, Having, we still, we've gone from 20 people in engineering to 200. And we still use Git, and we still have no real issues with that. We still use Perl, Python, and all those scripting tools. Everything is really working well for that. The infrastructure, having Debian, having packages, using Linux, was a real step up from having interacted with proprietary router systems where you have to have one big legacy build for the whole thing, being able to do individual packages. And we also had a surfeit of tools. Every time somebody came along with a feature request, there was at least something to start with. So if somebody came along and asked for PPPoE, we could find infrastructure even if it was outdated or a starting point that somebody had done PPPoE on Linux. Um, and so we really got a, a rocket start with that stuff. And what I think the biggest thing that I've discovered is at the time, we were trying to build a platform. And if you're trying to build a platform, it's a big problem. And it, you basically create your, you, you create your own universe. I think a lot of times now you'll see that a lot of open source projects work as packages. So they're part of a bigger ecosystem. So if we had tried to do the command line as a package in part of Debian, Cumulus comes along and they're running Debian and they decide, we can take this open source thing and use it a different way. Other people can pick it up and go a different direction. It's a lot harder to take a distribution and go a different direction. Although two, there are two out there who have done it. Um, Ubiquity Networks uses forked off an earlier version of Yada to do their infrastructure. And there, somebody picked up when we stopped doing the open source community version, picked up that, and it's iOS. So there are two that picked it up as distributions. But if we stick to packages, we could have gotten multi-vendors, and we could have been more decoupled from what we're doing. And the, the other thing from an infrastructure point of view, I wish we had done a better job of communicating the process of building things, involving developers, and had a maintainer. Have a community maintainer. Have somebody that people can go to. Have somebody that goes out and talks about it. Have events where people come in. Because making contacts and getting involvement would have helped a lot. And if you did it on a package basis, it could be a lot more focused. And now, 
we've got a whole bunch of new technologies. So I suspect that if I were to reinvent this again, you would see things like the DPDK as the basis for this. Uh, there's an ITF standard called Yang, which is also providing a programmatic interface to this. OpenStack, Open Daylight, P4. There's a whole lot of new technologies that are just right for this. Um, and we're using some of them, but the same thing is true could be used in an open source world. Um, so what happened to Viata? Well, we got, when we got sucked into brocade, in reality, we're just contributing as much, but we're contributing out to the world. Not people, we're not contributing a distro to the world. We're contributing code back to all these projects. So we have more co contributions now than we ever did. We just don't have the open source distribution. And I think that that actually works well, because um, we give as much as we get. So we get a lot of the things from these projects, but we also give a lot back. Um, so the new one, the way I like the paradigm is, as the free software gets mature, um, we no longer need the free software thing. Everybody else is doing the software networking hype for us. Um, and instead of being just one vendor with one distro, we're really multi-vendor collaboration. I know stuff I've done, the DPDK is showing up on Cisco's software router as well. And you know, Brocade calls this the new IP thing, and they have this whole new networking paradigm. But really, it's built from a lot of this. It's not built from a distribution model. So that's what I had. Do you have some questions about this? And I hope I piqued your interest. Yes? What's Brocade's um, business model? OK, Brocade's business model is we sell um, a software router and a software load balancer and a software environment for dealing with uh, wire wireless networks like you see in cell phone towers. And so the Viata base became what's in the virtual router. And we actually have right now, there's two versions. One is basically the old version that has the enhanced routing protocol stacks and the new version, which has the underlying data plane um, software to get the higher performance. Um, and uh, we've also got a, a version that's just, the one that's just out also supports distributed data planes. And uh, yes. So when you were talking about the lack of a lot of users, which didn't have a lot of developers who were participating, so would you, if you were getting a lot of help requests, where you get, how, how do you feel about bug reports? Is that a help to, to you? I, okay, that's an interesting question. How did I feel about bug reports? We had a lot of users. The engineering people viewed it as a bug is a bug. Um, I view there's a difference between bug reports and support requests, because the bug report is, I type this command and it blows up. Engineering can take action on that. Support request is, how do I install this? What do I do this? You know, we didn't get involved with all that hand-holding stuff. So it's a pretty good difference. Um, I think that we treated all bugs equally, and I think that's also important. So everything that was in Bugzilla got a priority. And sure, the priority is going to be if big customer X is paying for it and they report the bug, that gets a higher priority. But if it's a the kernel crash bug, it's going to get a high priority from anybody. So. And I think you see that even with commercial products today. I mean, we have a very extensive bug tracking system when we keep track of things based on that. Yeah. Did the forking of your product, the open source product, to other commercial entities, did that have any contribution on closing it down? 
Not really, because they were all on. We took it. At, um, we started out with uh, running the router on basically a white box PC. We switched over because customers wanted to be able to not switched over. We made available you could buy hardware that we OEM that had it in it. That proved to be not cost effective because if you've ever dealt with OEM hardware, you have to requalify it, you have to keep up to date. It wasn't the revenue coming back from providing those systems wasn't matching the cost of doing that. So, at the same time, we switched to everybody's going like, "Wow, we can run this in a VM. This is really cool," you know, on Amazon and all these other places. So we basically phased out of the hardware business and we're in the in the virtual appliance business. Ubiquity was targeting how do I do Wi-Fi routers in um, enterprises and whatever. And that wasn't a market that Viata wanted to be in. So it was separate. There was also um, several people went over there. A couple of people went over there. And we kept in contact. But at some point, the fork becomes so wide that the cross fertilization diminishes to very little. Um, so, and that's, that's pretty much still the case. And that's kind of the danger. Um, and I know I, I, as part of Brocade, I don't want to, I'm not going to contribute to the open source iOS project, but not because I dislike it or whatever. I just don't want to get cross-contaminated or be accused in any way of doing that. But I noticed that they're having a hard time getting forward. I mean, they're still on Debian 6, I think, or something, which is so old, like several years old, because they couldn't roll forward. So I mean, I know that that work, it's really hard. I mean, when things fork, they just wander away. Yes? I think that where we are now, we couldn't do it. But at the time, we could have. I think, and also, if we had gotten more involved in the geographies. I mean, I, I also discovered that different geographies have different environments, and some are more susceptible and more available for developers. And it would have been hard, but I mean, I know that you'll find, if, if you look at the con contributions to projects like Linux, it's kind of not evenly distributed. You'll find that there's more contributions from Europe, Australia, Japan, and now China than there is from US for the overall population. I think that as we reach that size, we could have pushed that up maybe by having events or something or having partner group events to help encourage that. And I think that. When you, it's kind of like one of these um, new businesses that spread by word of mouth. If you encourage one developer and they get two or three others, it kind of snowballs. And I don't think we did a good job of creating that snowball. But that's kind of what happens in a, in a small company. You're resource limited. When you're resource limited, you have to make choices about what you're doing. And the choices were, OK, let's get these features in today so we can get these things out to our customers so we can get more revenue. Yes? What were the mistakes that we see here today? Where we're going now is um, basically we're going to uh, grow in terms of features, functionality, distribution. Um, and we're also working at providing. I'm, I mean, I'm in the technology group, and so we're working on leading edge stuff to basically how can we make this be usable everywhere. Um, but. So that was, was the proprietary I think that um, we're going to find more and more where we incorporate open source projects and contribute back into them. 
so when we have a multi-vendor project come along, we'll be one of the vendors involved. But so we're not take. In other words, when we take something, we give back. Um, the stuff we create for ourselves, it's a lot harder to figure out a way to open source and create. Um, I think some of it will happen, but. Um, I don't think so, and that's not because of not trying. It's because the kernel's trying to have a lot of functionality, and so the core of the kernel, we may get fast at the same speed, but only if you're willing to turn off firewall, this, that, you know, build a stripped down mini kernel like you'd have an Internet of Things device. Once you add all these other things, there's all these other, and, and shared processes and whatever. The DPDK is fast because it's right at the hardware. It doesn't do any locking, and it relies on you to do all the partitioning and mapping yourself. Um. Well, thank you. You can get a hold of me later and uh, ask me questions anytime. Thank you.